Today, we are going to be looking into the case of Nanny Doss, a woman who didn't stop at just killing four of her husbands, but also her children, grandchildren, and even her mother. A woman with a chilling disregard for the sacred bonds of family. Join me as we explore the heinous crimes of Nanny Doss, the giggling granny. Nanny Doss was born on the 4th of November, 1905 to James and Louisa Hazel in Blue Mountain, Alabama. Her family was a large one, with her being the oldest of five daughters. Her childhood had about the typical amount of abuse most serial killers endure. Her father was a violent man, beating his wife and children at the slightest provocation. He would force his daughters to work on the family farm for money instead of letting them pursue an education. At age seven, Nanny suffered a head injury which plagued her all the way into adulthood with severe headaches, depression, and blackouts. Nanny and her sisters were also forbidden from socializing or wearing makeup by her father, who wanted to protect them from the countrymen, although it was more about control than protection. Nanny was tragically sexually assaulted by a number of these men, and when she reported to her father, he simply just didn't believe her. And so in a bid to get away from her life, Nanny began to read romance stories written in the love magazines owned by her mother. She would fantasize about meeting and marrying her Prince Charming one day and getting away from her grim existence. By the time Nanny turned 16, she felt like her fantasies had finally become real. Nanny got married to her first husband, Charlie Braggs, after knowing him for four months. But soon enough, Nanny was dismayed to discover that Charlie wasn't her Prince Charming, but an alcoholic who had an annoyingly controlling mother who reigned over their marriage. Between 1924 and 1927, Charlie and Nanny would go on to have four daughters in just three years. This insane spree of childbirth also took a toll on Nanny, and she slipped into deeper depression. Around this time, Nanny lost her second and third daughters to what appeared to be a stomach upset. But Charlie smelled foul play and wasn't buying it, so he fled for his life with his first daughter, Melvina, leaving his last daughter, Florine, behind with Nanny and his mother. Charlie must have been onto something because the deaths of Nanny's children was in fact incredibly fishy, especially because Nanny was quick to cash the $500 life insurance money she had put on her two girls before they died. Shortly after that, Charlie's mother mysteriously passed away. Charlie didn't want anything to do with Nanny after that, and in 1928, he returned with his daughter and legally ended their marriage. Nanny didn't object to the divorce, but she got lonely after a while. After all, she was a lover at heart. So she went out in search of love and posted an ad in the Lonely Hearts column in 1929. A man named Frank Harrelson started sending her letters, and a while later they got married. Nanny was all giddy to relocate with her girls, but was disappointed when she learned that Frank was just like Charlie, an alcoholic, and had a criminal record for domestic abuse. In 1943, Nanny's daughter Melvina got married to a man named Mosey and gave birth to Nanny's first grandson, Robert. Two years later, she had another baby. This time, Nanny came to help because Melvina had had a hard labor. Hours after the baby was born, they were reported dead, but the doctors simply couldn't find a cause. However, Melvina swore that in her delirious state, she saw something unspeakable. Her own mother, Nanny, stabbing her child with a hairpin. But nobody believed Melvina. After all, who would believe that a grandmother would puncture the brains of her own grandchild? Melvina probably thought she was just seeing things as well. In October 1945, Melvina left Robert, her son, in Nanny's care so that she could go see her father. That night, Robert suddenly passed away. The cause of his death was said to be asphyxiation. This was probably the last straw. Melvina knew the monster her mother was. She tried to call the attention of the police, pointing out that Nanny had probably taken Robert's life, but her claims were dismissed because of a lack of evidence. If only they had believed her, they would have saved the lives of many innocent people that would become Nanny's victims over the years. Of course, Nanny was sure to cash in the $500 insurance money that she'd placed on Robert two months before his death. Heading back to Nanny's marriage to Frank, well, it was nothing short of terrible. After bearing his abuse for 16 years, she was tired and decided to put an end to it. So she struck again. One night, he returned home drunk for the umpteenth time and attempted to rape her. So Nanny topped his bottle with poison 
and he fell sick for a week, then passed away. Nanny didn't grieve too much, and the arrival of his $2,500 life insurance money certainly wiped away any errant tears. She bought herself a piece of land and a house in Alabama. At this point, you'd think the police and insurance investigators would be suspicious, but they weren't. And so Nanny was free and ready for her next lover. After some time had passed, Nanny got bored and went on a trip to Lexington, North Carolina. There, she met and married Arlie Lanning, another pen pal she met through the Lonely Hearts column. But Nanny was once again disappointed when she learned that Arlie was just like her previous husbands, an alcoholic and a womanizer. Despite that, she played her part professionally as the doting wife. After five years of their marriage, Nanny either got tired of Arlie or tired of putting up the act of the perfect wife. So she poisoned Arlie's food and he died. Because of his drinking problem, his death was blamed on heart failure. The entire town came to mourn at his funeral and to console his faithful wife. Once again, Nanny got the insurance money, $1,500 of it. She was rather furious, however, when Arlie's sister was given his house. And so the house mysteriously caught on fire a few days later. She wasn't just a murderer, she was an arsonist too. Anything to get that payday. Nanny was staying with Arlie's mother at the time, and once she cashed the insurance money for the house, Arlie's elderly mother mysteriously passed in her sleep, while Nanny went to Alabama to take care of her bedridden sister, Debbie. She didn't stay with Debbie for too long though, because she wanted to get back out in search of love. So a few weeks into her stay, she packed her things and left her sister, who was found dead some days later by the neighbors. It's almost amazing how nobody noticed the trail of death this woman left behind her. Nanny was still in search of her Prince Charming, so she joined a club called the Diamond Circle Club and soon found another man named Richard L. Morton. And so they got married. Their marriage wasn't everything she dreamed it would be when she found out that Richard was secretly dating another woman. This didn't sit well with Nanny, but she was tied down because her sick mother had come to stay with them. She managed to endure being cheated on for a while, but the telltale signs of Nanny's poisonous hands started to show. One week into her mother's arrival, the woman began to complain about stomach aches and soon passed. Nanny must have mourned her mother for three more months, or just tried to stay low before striking again in order not to raise suspicions. None of this is certain, but what is certain is that three months after her mother died, Richard was also killed, and without any restrictions, Nanny received his $1,500 insurance money. Nanny didn't take much time to grieve before she was back on the streets in search of love. She met Samuel Doss in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who became her fifth husband. Compared to her previous marriages, Samuel was the picture-perfect Prince Charming for Nanny. Instead of alcoholism, abusive tendencies, and womanizing, Samuel was principled and church-going. But Nanny soon became tired of this marriage as well. Samuel would nag her about reading her favorite love magazines or her detective stories, stop her from listening to the radio or talking to their neighbors, and was overall a very controlling spouse. But instead of trying to reach a compromise with her husband, she decided to free him of his mortal coil. In September of 1953, Samuel was admitted into a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma for flu-like symptoms. The hospital diagnosed a severe digestive tract infection, and he had to spend a whole month in a hospital bed before being discharged. Upon his discharge, Nanny panicked because she was in a hurry to cash his life insurance policies and fly the coop. So she poisoned him, and by morning, he was dead. A doctor at the hospital that had treated Samuel smelled foul play, so he ordered an autopsy. He also tactfully convinced Nanny that an autopsy would bring her even more money from his life insurance, so she went along with it. This time, however, Nanny didn't get any insurance money, and you can probably guess why. Samuel's autopsy revealed large amounts of arsenic in his system, and Nanny was finally arrested. The police took her in for questioning, but Nanny didn't budge, even after several hours in the interrogation room. She instead engaged the police in petty talk and told stories, laughing as she did, seemingly trying to maneuver her way out even after getting caught. When the officers got tired, they went to rest, but in their waking up, 
the media had already published information about Nanny and the murder of her husband. Nanny's relatives and other people who knew her began to bring out evidence against her, and she was forced to confess to the murders. Autopsies conducted on the bodies of her dead relatives showed large amounts of arsenic or rat poison inside them. When asked what her motive was, she told the police officers she was looking for real romance, like in her romance stories. She also blamed the murders on the head injuries she suffered as a child. Her story was published in various articles, and Nanny was tagged with various names. She was called the Green Granny because she would laugh and giggle whenever she was talking about her killings. She was also called the Lonely Hearts Killer because she met and killed the men she married from a Lonely Hearts column in the newspaper. Nanny faced trial, but was only sentenced to life imprisonment for the death of her fifth husband, Samuel Doss. At the time of her trial, there was no death penalty. Nanny died in a hospital in Oklahoma a few years later in June 1965 from leukemia. What do you think was her motive? It's clear that she wanted to get rich at the cost of the lives of her victims, or was it truly the result of a head injury she'd suffered in her childhood? Let me know in the comments below. There's a lot more where this came from, here at the Murder Encyclopedia.